everyone, welcome to our first live Q&A of 2018. I'm here this afternoon with Dan Calladine, who is our Head of Media Futures at CARA. Welcome Hello. Dan, thank you for being the first of 2018. Um, every December, Dan produces our top 10 uh, trends for the following year, and it's a report that our network and our clients really look forward to receiving. So we're just gonna take 20 minutes today to touch on some of those trends. Um, so which ones are we gonna focus on today, Dan? So the ones I'm talking about specifically today are about the convergence of e-commerce and retail, about the next stage of augmented reality, which I think is gonna involve mapping, um, about shared experiences, and also about smart cities. But I think we may have time to touch on a couple of other things afterwards as well. Yeah. If there's any questions, for example. Yeah, so we're taking questions. If you do have any questions, we'll, we'll allow some time at the end to get into those, just pop them in the feed, and uh, the person that's sitting to my right will slide them across the table. And uh, we'll take those questions. So let's get into the first one then, Dan. So the convergence of retail and e-commerce. So I think this is the biggest trend for the whole year, and I think this is a trend which has been going on for the last few years, but really accelerated last year, and this year shows no signs of slowing down. Um, it used to be the case, I think, that you would buy very different things online to the sorts of things that you would buy in stores. So, in, you know, back in the old days, in the early days of the internet, people didn't buy food online, they didn't buy clothing online. Um, Boo.com went out of business because it was trying to sell clothes online. Now, uh, you look at a you look at a service like um, uh, Preta Porte, Preta Porte, and more than half of what they sell is not just sold online, but sold through mobile. So there's been a massive growth of e-commerce, but at the same time, there have been really interesting things happening around retail. And what we saw last year was Amazon bought Whole Foods, um, and then suddenly Amazon is the second largest employer in the US, um, you know, has a whole, uh, you know, has a whole network of, of physical stores, whereas a year ago they didn't really at all. But at the same time, Walmart has been going the other way um, in buying e-commerce companies and trying to really ramp up its e-commerce capabilities. So I think there's been a convergence of those two big players trying to meet in the middle, but then also what we're seeing is uh, a lot of, and, and also actually since since I wrote the, the presentation, uh, what we've seen is the opening of the Amazon Go store, which is the store in Seattle where people don't need to queue up to pay at a till because the cameras in the store just watch everything that you take off the shelf and put into your bag, and then you just walk out um, once you've you know, you finished your shopping. But I think it's not only larger companies like that. I think uh, there are much smaller brands who are doing really fascinating things, including opening things like flagship stores, because they appreciate that while e-commerce is very strong, um, the whole thing about having a physical presence on the high street is great for the brand, great for marketing, great for letting people know that you exist and letting people really experience the brand trying before they buy as well. Yeah, and as a media agency, Dan, what do you think the implications of this trend are? What should we be doing differently? So I think the main thing is that um, we need to really help brands reinforce the brand experience, help our clients reinforce the brand experience. Um, I think there's a number of, number of ways that we can do that. We can reach out to our networks, we can reach out um, through the partners that we have, and we can stay on top of how things work in this increasingly confusing world. Um, it's very hard for people to keep on top of all this sort of stuff. So one of the roles of an agency is really to understand everything and to you know, be a compass and set a course for where brands should actually be going in the future. Yeah, what you said about, about partnership, I think you know we're seeing a lot more work coming through the CARA network where we're partnering with uh, agencies like Isobar and MKTG to really take, you know, full accountability for that, for building out that that consumer experience. So, um, moving on to the next one, augmented maps. So, augmented reality has been around for a few years, and a couple of years ago, a lot of people it became very mainstream through Pokemon Go. Um, there have also been some really interesting things around uh, you know, so Snapchat placing works of art around the world, uh, Star Wars film within the Star Wars app, you could look at landmarks like the Eiffel Tower, um, London Eye, and you could see 
and spaceships hovering above those. So there have been some really fascinating things that people have done around augmented reality. But I think the next stage of this is going to be uh, user-generated augmented reality. So in effect, there will, be, uh, there will be a blogger for augmented reality or there will be an Instagram for augmented reality. It will become easy, I think, for people to create their own elements of augmented reality. And we're already seeing this through sort of professional developer tools which Apple has created with its AR kit. But what I imagine we might start to see um, is people being able to put effectively emojis onto, or emojis or, or symbols onto uh, uh, cafes, and bars, and restaurants that they like, and you know, leaving almost treasure trails around the city for their friends to find. Um, and I think this could be, you know, this could be fantastic for brands because it will alert people to, to great things near to them that they might not know, you know, effectively like a secret city, there'll be something behind this wall, but you've no idea what it is. But this will help you discover things more easily. Um, but then also it could potentially be like a one-star TripAdvisor review for some businesses where, you know, people could say, oh, don't go in here because I had a bad experience or, um, you know, staff are rude in this, in this short shop or, or something like that. Um, and I think there's, I think there's, there's going to be lots of really interesting opportunities around this and I think it will be something that will be fun and that people will start to use, you know, uh, and discover them for themselves and then things will start to go viral to use, to use a phrase yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then shared experiences. So one thing about the internet and we've seen through the rise of YouTube, Spotify, um, Amazon as well, is that the internet is fantastic for, for developing a long tail and for allowing people to watch what they want, when they want to watch it. Uh, you know, we were talking a few years ago about the desktop TV schedule, about the fact that um, a lot of people, when they go, come home in the evening, they won't turn on TV to see what's on. They'll have you know, either saved up or they'll have access to whatever sort of programming is out there. And you know, we've seen how many millions of people in the UK subscribe to things like Netflix. Um, but I think what is, what is really fascinating as a, a sort of combined social and technological trend through this is the rise of people trying to create a shared experience within digital media. Um, there's a new app which came out in the States, it's now launched in the UK called HQ, and it's a trivia game, so it's, it's like a pub quiz in effect. Um, it happens live twice a day. Uh, I was talking to a colleague about this who was in the States over Christmas, and he said that you had, uh, you know, some days you had a million people playing along simultaneously. You get 15 questions, all multiple choice, you have to answer the questions. If you get one wrong, then you're out of it and you can continue to watch, but you can't continue to play. Then at the end of the 15, all of the people who've got all the questions right, then share out a prize pot. So, you know, it's, it's a fantastic idea. But the whole point of the idea is everybody plays along at the same time. And you can see pictures on Twitter and Insta of, you know, whole offices all crowded around somebody's, uh, somebody's computer like a like a trivia pub quiz game in a, in a pub a few years ago. Um, but then also you see people like Netflix, and while the whole point of Netflix is there is no schedule, you watch at your own speed, what I think they're trying to do in dropping some of their biggest shows on particular points and, and telling people, you know, this is now available to watch, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, things like Black Mirror, um, six episodes became available just before New Year's Day, so I think quite a few people will have watched Black Mirror as part of their New Year's Day, you know, as part of their New Year's Day viewing, because suddenly you've got all this amazing content, and then, you know, when they're back at work the next day, they can have a chat with their friends and things about it. So what I think is, as a sort of evolution of how this sort of content works and how these delivery platforms work, we're getting to a point where people are going to try to create a shared experience, almost like a sports event. Yeah. So if you look back at 2017, what do you think are like the missed opportunities well, or I, things that spring to mind? I mean, it's almost like a sports tournament where, in the same way that you know an awful lot of people are going to be watching the World Cup, and so you could put something in place to actually hijack it, even if you're not an official um, sponsor. You know, you could have had somebody issuing retro packaging for their snacks to, to capitalise on the 
the second season of Stranger Things, which dropped in um, uh, at the end of October, I think it was. And so, you know, as well as watching, you could actually be, you know, pretending you were in the 80s, eating the yeah. old, these old snacks and stuff like that. So I think we'll see an awful lot of that sort of thing around these sorts of opportunities this year. Cool. Um, the last one, uh, Smart Cities. So smart cities has been a phrase that people have been using for several years, I think. And um, it's something which I talked about with our colleagues over at Posterscope. Um, they did a report, the, the Asian office did a report on this uh, in last year, and I used that when I was writing the trend. And what we're seeing is a bit of a two-speed two situation where in, the, you know, in Asia they're actually leading with this because they have more of the infrastructure of things like sensors. So whilst in London, you have an awful lot of people um, submitting data subconsciously through things like their use of apps like City Mapper and Strava and even Waze. What we're, ha what we're seeing in Europe is you're seeing um, a lot of sensors set up for things like air quality. Um, th there was a case in the, uh, the Postscope report where there was a city in South Korea and the city had, had effectively you know, been networked throughout. Uh, there were old people's homes where if people opted in, they could effectively be tracked by something that they would wear, where you know, if somebody went missing from the home, they could easily be, be found because you know, it was sharing their location. And I think we'll see a lot of things like that. And where this, why Posterscope are interested and why we're interested and where this becomes a media topic is that you'll be able to use addressable advertising much more, um, you know, much more creatively through knowing roughly where what sort of people will be at what sort of times of day in different sorts of cities. So none of this is personally identifiable information, but it's really saying, you know, this sort of person goes here at this sort of time, therefore we could do something really interesting yeah. with these three screens we've got, and they're probably going to be seeing these screens in this sort of order because that's the way people normally move around this sort of neighbourhood. So increased creativity and relevance. So, so really yeah. increased creativity, relevance, and targetability yeah. as well. Okay. Um, I think we've had a question come through on the feed. Perfect. So we'll, we'll go to that now. And just to remind everyone that we've got about five minutes left. So if you do have any questions, please pop them into the feed. Um, so the prospect of connected cars seems exciting. How do you envisage this will change advertising opportunities? So I think... Um, I think connected cars are going to be really interesting. And it's really the idea that at the moment, or if you have a non, you know, if you have a, a regular car with a, with effectively analog, um, analog in car entertainment, then you're getting the same adverts as everybody else. But as soon as the car becomes connected, as soon as the car and the in car entertainment system knows who you are and has got a history, and you know, knows you're this person on Spotify or this person with DAX, then suddenly um, there's much more capability available to you know to target things at you to make it more useful, to be more relevant, and potentially more valuable for brands as well. Great. Um, we've got another one here. You mentioned in your 2018 trends deck that Burger King has created its own cryptocurrency. How soon do you believe this trend will catch on? Well, this is, uh, so, so there are a few things in the trends deck and, you know, the augmented maps and um, the smart cities are quite future facing. There's a, within that one, what I think is that there's a few brands who will try to do it. So actually since writing the trend, Kodak has come up with Kodak Coin, which is effectively their own, their own solution for photographers to, to sell their work and to keep a track of where their work is being used. Um, I do think that brands that are global, like Burger King is, and also like Starbucks is, do have the potential to effectively, instead of giving people reward points, create their own global currency so that people can use it um, not only you know in store wherever they are in the world, but also with other partners so they could trade it for, for other sorts of things. Um, so I think within a couple of years we might see more people trying to do that. I think the one, the Burger King one is in Russia only, and I think it's possibly a bit of a marketing stunt, mm. but I think it's a really fascinating idea. Um, and I think we may look back on, you know, in five years' time, there may be about you know, 10 or 20 
really big brands with really big loyalty programs that are doing similar sorts of things and then allowing you, you know, instead of just getting more coffee or more burgers or something to do, to do really valuable things with the points that you're earning. Yeah. So I think we've got a little bit of time left and I think perhaps sure. we, should, we should dip into voice because that's a big one at the moment and we've got lots of clients asking us for a point yes. of view on voice. Uh, so, yeah, so I think, um, I think there'll never be as few people as there are at the moment doing voice searches or there'll never be as few Amazon Echoes as there are at the moment. In fact, whenever, whenever I go out and do these presentations, I always ask people, I always ask the room if anyone's got an Amazon Echo and in some rooms it's about half the people there who, who've actually got them. Uh, and so I think brands need to develop a, a strategy for voice in terms of understanding how voice search is different to textual search, which is that generally speaking that people will, you know, will use ten words for a search rather than use three words for a search if they're, if they're tapping in with their thumbs. Um, and then also they need to have a strategy for being able to be discoverable on platforms like Amazon Echo and, um, and, and, and Google Home and also now the Apple one which is coming out later this month. But then also another thing I think about voice is that, and I, you know, I'm sure I'm as guilty of this as anybody, but within our industry, we obsess about screens in terms of yeah. how many screens people have, how much time they spend in front of screens, which screens they're, they're watching what on. But actually an awful lot of what we consume, whether it's Spotify or whether it's podcasts, um, or whether it's just the radio, is purely audio. And it can be a hugely effective communication yeah. medium. And so with our obsession with screens, we need to remember to also you know, keep an eye out for, for voice and take an account of voice and the sorts of opportunities that's available within that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're out of time. Um, thanks for joining us today, Thank Dan. Uh, really hopefully good. that was interesting. You can find Dan's full 10 trends report on uh, cara.com uh, or on SlideShare. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much.